discussion today. Uh, my name is Barry Robinson. I have the privilege of being the chair or the facilitator at least for this uh, for the session here. Um, formerly from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, late of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Ireland, as I tend to say. We have two very distinguished speakers here today to help us guide us through and frame the discussion that we'll have. And the theme that has been chosen is Transforming Security and Defence, a 21st Century Model. Uh, before I introduce our panellists, uh, a couple of housekeeping points. First of all, can I remind everybody to mute their phones, but not turn them off, because by way of compensation, we do want to encourage you to tweet using the handle at IIEA. Sorry, at IIEA. Um, the initial addresses will be on the record. However, the Q&A section, a session afterwards, is under the Chatham House rule, whereby participants are free to use the information received in discussion, but neither the identity nor the affiliation of the speakers or nor that of any of the other participants should be disclosed. And this is to encourage a free-flowing and, um, and open exchange. Um, our discussion today will be concerned with how the strategic con context for Europe's security and defence is rapidly changing, going beyond the historical concept of defending the sovereignty and territorial integrity of nation states. The traditional challenges still exist in certain areas and in the modern defence environment, uh, states face a significant transformation uh, of military capacity through new technology. However, the concept of security has broadened considerably in the decades since the end of the Cold War, and a more diverse range of issues are now seen as uh, recognised as posing security threats, including the pressure on the planet's resources arising from phenomena such as climate change, energy security. The physical security of citizens is threatened by new and more atavistic forms of international, international terrorism, and liberal democracies face other tests of their resilience, including from state actors targeting the integrity and transparency of the functioning of fair political competition, uh, public discourse, and the technological uh, infrastructure on which delivery of public services and a great deal of global economic activity relies. Um, our contrib contributors today will focus on the revitalization of collective security and the use of modern deterrence involving the defence forces, the wider government, industry and population. Our first speaker is Elizabeth Braw, native of Sweden. She directs the Modern uh, Deterrence Programme at the Royal United Services Institute, which focuses on how government, businesses and civil society can work together to strengthen a uh, country's defence against existing and emerging threats. Uh, previously, Elizabeth worked at Control Risks following a career as a journalist and was a visiting fellow at the University of Oxford. Perhaps, perhaps Elizabeth, I could ask you to take the floor. Thank you, Barry. I'll, uh, I will take the floor. I just stand. Or even take the podium. <laughs> so that I can see the screens as well. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'd like to start by showing you a video. Um, and I hope it works. I, I was reminded of technology um, a few weeks ago and, and the perils of technology. Um, apparently Twitter went down for 15 minutes. I missed this monumental event, but Twitter did go down for 15 minutes. And the reason I found out was that when I went on Twitter, uh, it had already come back up and somebody tweeted this, chatted to my wife while Twitter was down. She seems nice. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I do chat to my husband even when Twitter is working. But so, um, I will stop by showing you a video here. Let's see.
okay, who knows what this is? You all know what it is, right? So that's uh, the Stena Impero. And the reason I want to show this video is that um, Stena Impero is part of a, of a company, obviously a shipping company that uh, operates in the Strait of Hormuz and, and in fact uh, around the world. And um, nobody really hates Stena Impero or the 23 uh, crew members of different nationalities w that were um, on board at that time. But still, the Stena Impero was seized. Uh, and it was seized as part of a geopolitical game. So um, the fate of these 23 seamen and well, crew members on board is tied to the JCPOA. And in fact, that is the reality that we are seeing today, that companies are targets in, in geopolitical games. And of course, we can say companies have always been targets and, and um, factories were bombed during World War II. Well, today we are not at war, but companies uh, are being targeted not because of anything they do, but simply because they're convenient targets. And uh, as a result of, for example, the seizure of ships in, in the Strait of Hormuz, uh, insurance rates have gone up for companies operating ships in the Strait of Hormuz. Now, what does that lead you to? What, which conclusion does that lead to? Companies will think twice about sailing through the, the Strait of Hormuz. And that means that we, uh, the end uh, recipients of whatever it is they are shipping, including oil and, and other necessities, we may feel the pain if they decide not to ship, um, which they will if, if these um, acts of aggression continue. Now, I want to show you a completely different video. Uh, here is a gentleman. Um, I don't know if you haven't heard of uh, Jim Hagerman Snarber. Uh, is anybody familiar with him? He, his title is after chairman of uh, Maersk, which is the world's largest shipping company. Um, Maersk ships 20% of all goods that travel around the world, and we should remember that 80% of the world's trade travels by sea. So Maersk is a crucial part of our globalized economy. Um, I'm not sure actually how much food is imported in Ireland, but I do know that 50% of food in the UK is imported, and of course a lot of other goods. And um, Maersk transports a lot of those goods. So now we'll uh, see, uh, we'll let Jim Hagemas now explain what happened to, but does anybody know what happened to uh, Maersk? I should, I should ask you before, two, two summers ago. Uh, does anybody remember? No, in that case, I'll, I'll <coughs> let you hear from, from the chairman himself. I never forget it was the 27th of uh, June when I was uh, woken up at four o'clock in the morning. A call came from the office that we had suffered a, a cyber attack, and uh, then a process started, which I'll talk a little bit about. Now, before we go into the details of the attack itself, AP Miller Mask is the largest container shipping company in the world. We transport roughly 20% of, of world trade in containers, so, so we're a very significant part of the infrastructure of making the world uh, actually run. And um, every 15 minutes, an average, a, a a container ship will come to a port somewhere with uh, between 10 and 20,000 containers. Uh, so now you understand the criticality of infrastructure. We were hit by the uh, non patch uh, um, uh, virus. Um, in fact, that meant that we were actually collateral damage of a uh, probably a state attack uh, situation. Uh, so, uh, and um, the impact of that was that we uh, basically found uh, that we had to uh, reinstall our inf an entire infrastructure. So there you heard what happened to Mask. Mask was attacked by NotPetya, which was a virus that uh, the Russian government had unleashed against Ukraine. You're smiling, you probably remember. Uh, so the Russian government unleashed against Ukraine to take down Ukrainian uh, government institutions and and companies, which it did, but then this, this, this virus traveled on and brought down Maersk, which went essentially dark for six days, and um, a number of other companies as well. Maersk lost $300 million in the process. Mondelez, which is the maker of um, Oreo cookies, for example, the, uh, um, an American confectionery giant, enormous company, lost $188 million. Uh, Merck, which is an American pharmaceutical giant, lost $870 million. 
And it's not like anybody hates masks. In fact, we all love masks because they bring us our daily goods. <coughs> and it's not like anybody hates uh, Mondelez or Merck either. They, are just, they were just convenient targets for this virus that had been um, unleashed, as it turned out, by, by Russia. Now, crucially, uh, so there are viruses that go around all the time, and most of the time uh, they are not attributed to anybody in particular. But in this particular case, the UK government and the US government uh, did attribute it to Russia. And what happened after that was that um, when Mondelez claimed uh, on its insurance policy with Zurich, Zurich said, no, we are not paying because it was an act of war. It had been attributed to a government. So this is a situation we live in today where companies are targeted or are, as, as Jim Snabben and Hage said, uh, the et Habman Snage, rather, uh, said, are the collateral damage of state attacks, um, even though nobody really hates them. And then that is um, what one might call an act of war. Uh, now, the question is, what constitutes war? Well, Mondelez, the maker of Oreo cookies, is currently fighting out the nature of warfare with Zurich, it's insurer. They are doing that in a court in Illinois. That's the new nature of warfare, where a confectionery giant and an insurance company and a judge in Illinois are trying to decide what constitutes an act of war. And I'm mentioning that because it's something we have to get used to. Now, it's, it's very common today to talk, as, as you all know, to talk about hybrid warfare. And uh, I think the term is being thrown around a bit too lightly because what we, what we really mean is uh, sub-threshold aggression, or what I call blended aggression, where these sort of acts uh, that are not kinetic in nature, that don't involve any uh, soldiers on the ground, but simply sneaky attacks on civil society, where they are proliferating simply because our civil societies are so vulnerable, because we are so advanced, and because we rely on the globalized economy that until now has been a very strong force for good. And because we are so ill-prepared for it, uh, there, how could MASK uh, anticipate a government-sponsored uh, or government-initiated virus hitting its, uh, its IT system? IT system companies don't, um, until now, they haven't uh, thought of themselves as, as being uh, in the line of fire for foreign governments. Well, they are. And so, and so are we if we think about disinformation. I don't know if, if anybody here feels qualified to identify what constitutes, this, constitutes disinformation. I'm sure we have all consumed disinformation without knowing that that's what it was. And, and there was recently a survey among, I think, um, British 16 and 17 year olds where 98% of them declared themselves able to identify disinformation. Well, then they were shown disinformation and real information, and lo and behold, they couldn't identify the disinformation. We have, um, we have just been spoiled um, for, I would argue, 30 years since the end of the Cold War. Um, we as, cit the citizens, as citizens of Western democracies and of liberal democracies have been spoiled. We haven't really faced any uh, acts of aggression other than terrorism, which is easy to define. But um, disinformation, does it harm us? Does it, it, it harms us in the accumulation. So the challenge we face as, as liberal democracies, whether or not we have a, a strong and aggressive uh, country on, on, on any of our borders, and so, by the way, I think that changes the political calculation or the strategic calculations for, for countries like Ireland and, and the UK as well, because threats today don't know any geographical boundaries. Of course, conventional military threats do, but cyber threats don't. And if, if an adversary is intent on disrupting our supply chains and thus <laughs> uh, forcing us to starve, uh, it's very easy. You just attack mask, and all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but after a while, we will find supermarket shelves uh, emptying out. So the question is, um, and this is something that, that my, the program I lead at Arusi deals with, uh, that's called Modern Deterrence, how do we deter those sort of threats? We are very good at deter deterring traditional threats. We have our armed forces. We have the nuclear deterrent, the, the NATO nuclear umbrella that protects, uh, and protects uh, American allies. 
um, and that has worked very well, clearly, since there haven't been any um, attacks or uh, uh, conventional military attacks on uh, NATO territory um, or the territory of, of uh, NATO's friends and allies. Um, but how do we deter threats that are not in that category? Uh, we are clearly not very good at it because otherwise they wouldn't be proliferating. And yet, uh, that is something we have to uh, establish and we can't establish it with what we currently have available, which is really only the armed forces. So deterrence against seizure of ships, deterrence against cyber attacks against companies, um, with the realization that no company can defend itself against a, a hostile nation state, and of course companies are at any rate not allowed to engage in, in offensive cyber against uh, anybody. Um, so unconventional attacks, like seizure of ships, cyber attacks, disinformation, even uh, hostile investments. I don't know if you have been following. In Finland, some mysterious buyers have been buying islands. Um, well, why would anybody buy islands in strategic locations? Who are these buyers? Should the government prevent the purchase of, isle, uh, of property on, on strategically located islands? These are uh, um, issues we should worry about in a national security context. Uh, while each issue may seem small, it doesn't really matter whether we have consumed a bit this, of disinformation because our democracy is strong. Well, in accumulation, they form a very subversive threat to our societies that will result, that can result in, in citizens losing faith in our institutions, in um, uh, crucial services going down, uh, power, the internet, and um, in fact, our way of life will, uh, is easily disrupted by, by the accumulation of these threats. So the question then is how to build up deterrence, and that's what I wanted to come to in my last five minutes or so. So our armed forces are very good. They do um, conventional deterrence. They do nuclear deterrence in the case of, of the UK and, and certain other countries. Well, a, a very small number of other countries. Um, but the rest of society, I would submit, has huge potential to add to the deterrence. Uh, in the UK, a few weeks ago, we had um, a power cut that was limited in nature, even though um, the news coverage around it made it seem like it was a, a catastrophic uh, power cut. It was, in fact, only 15 minutes long. But um, chaos ensued because nobody's used to power cut. Well, that signals to, to our adversaries that that attacking the power grid, hacking the power grid is a very good idea because we wouldn't know the first thing about what to do. Uh, we as a civil society, as ordinary residents and, and citizens, we also don't know how to handle this information, which is why we in the UK, for example, there is a, a big and divisive debate about the influence of Russia on the Brexit debate. And that invalidates, in essence, um, uh, the result can invalidate the result of democratic elections. If you can't be sure that, that um, the basis on which people voted was, um, uh, was one of uh, uh, truth and, and uh, straight facts, um, I would argue the first step is for business leaders to become educated about national security threats. And I think that includes uh, business leaders here in Ireland as well, who may not never have thought about national security threats simply because it's not part of the daily um, considerations of running a company. Um, school children, maybe they can be educated, taught about national security threats because they will feel, uh, uh, they, they will be the first to know, among the first to notice if power goes down or the internet goes down. Um, all of this should amount to a situation where disruption of daily life, which is really the goal of our adversaries, uh, is not such a big deal. Obviously, we should hope that it doesn't happen, but if it does happen, it shouldn't be a big deal. And if we can show that sort of resilience, societal resilience, as a backup to the armed forces, then we become less attractive as a target. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and uh, welcome your uh, your questions later. I'll just give a couple of examples of, of countries that are uh, individuals, steps that individual countries are taking. Latvia has, a, I think, a pioneering and very interesting new um, secondary school curriculum that includes 
something called in, um, the National Defence Curriculum, which is being rolled out in, in all secondary school uh, schools in the country, where uh, teenagers learn about national security threats to the country, how the country is set up to defend itself, and crucially, what they can do in case of disruption, so that when something happens, for example, an extended power cut um, or a disinformation campaign, that they then know what to do, rather, instead of sitting back and hoping for, for somebody, for the government, to come in and help them. Uh, the government ain't going to come and help them in every situation. And I think it illustrates what a uh, significant role the population can play if it's just educated and asked to contribute to society, even if it's that small step of knowing what to do in case of, of uh, an extended power cut or, or in case of a um, disinformation campaign. And if we start with that, I think people will feel that, that they have a role to play in national security, even if it's a small one. Some, uh, some of us will play larger roles, some will have careers in the armed forces or, or blue light services, but everybody does have a role to play. So I'll stop there and, and um, look forward to your, your questions later. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Elizabeth, for that very thought-provoking contribution with a particular focus on the impact of disruption on civil society and the contribution civil society can make to try and address it. And now I'd like to introduce General, General, uh, General Sir Richard Barons, who has a very distinguished military career, serving as commander of the Joint Forces Command, one of the six chiefs of staff of the UK Armed Forces. Uh, he has extensive field experience uh, leading operations in Bosnia, Kosovo, Northern Ireland, Iraq, and Afghanistan. Um, he read philosophy, politics, and economics at Oxford University. He's a distinguished fellow at the Royal, at the Royal United Services Institute, a noted authority on digital uh, transformation of armed forces, and on senior leadership. Thank you. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you the, uh, this afternoon. I have t uh, essentially 20 minutes uh, to change your lives. So, I'm going to go a bit of a clip. Um, the first point I want to make to you, every single one of us in this room is obviously a prisoner of our education, our experience, and our preferences. And our whole discussion about security is dominated by uh, how the last 30, 40 years have played out slightly longer, arguably, in my case. And the first thing I'm going to ask you to do in considering why European security has to change is to start to recognise most of that presumption is deeply unhelpful in the way that we need to think about the future because uh, nothing lasts forever and our world is changing and will change profoundly. And I'm going to give you three reasons why uh, uh, the world will feel very different. And the first of these things, we all grew up in the comfortable US-led Western world, and we now live in the foothills of what will become the Asian century, a world dominated by China in ways that are really hard to articulate, but will be unavoidable. And that's going to raise um, massive questions across not just economy, but also security and law. The second aspect uh, is that we're going to have this discussion about uh, how our world will be dominated by China uh, and how this will play out in the context of a, the relative decline of the US. And you may or may not subscribe to a Thucydides trap uh, uh, moment, but this will play out as for the first time in the history of our world, we bump into the limits of our planet's ability to meet our demands and expectations, whether that's population growth or urbanization or water scarcity or resource shortages or of course climate change. And, and we are going to live in a world where ways of life will be in jeopardy in the way that the, I won't expand on this, the, uh, the popularity of quinoa eroded the livelihood of 40,000 people who depended on the lake uh, in another country whose water disappeared to service our demand for this rather unpleasant stuff that appears with a salad. And we saw this just in the last couple of weeks in the confrontation with Brazil about the burning of the of the rainforest, where well, we're saying our oxygen comes from your forest, you'll need to stop burning it down. And Brazil says it's our forest, we'll do with it as we wish. And the third reason uh, why our world is changing is we're in the foothills of 
the profoundly significant industrial revolution of the digital age, powered by waves of artificial intelligence, and I subscribe to the four waves of AI, internet AI, business AI, where we're now, perception AI as machines see, hear, smell the world, and then autonomous uh, AI. This will play out over, over decades. It will disrupt entire industries, uh, countries, ways of life in ways that um, we can't... It is as fundamental as the um, development of, of electricity. And it is the combination of these three things, the Asian century, the limits on the planet, and the AI-fueled industrial revolution that's going to make our world feel so very different uh, to the passage of the last 40, um, 50 years. And when this happens, there is no supranational authority uh, that's going to define new rules of the road. Uh, there uh, is no um, reason that there will be a continuing consensus about what the rules of the roads are. The so-called rules-based international order is ours. It's not everybody's, uh, uh, clearly. Um, uh, the restraints of globalization on why people fight um, are, are not immutable. They are, I accept that they raise the bar to conflict, but they, um, but they are fraying. And there is no script to this period. There are no guarantees. So your collective sense of entitlement about your security and your prosperity, rooted in the comfortable passage of the post-Cold War era, doesn't matter to many billions of people around the world who think it's now their time. The second reason, big reason, why European security has to change is I subscribe to the view that the nature of war never changes, very Klaus Witzen, and we need to remember that. Brutal, feral, destructive, normally disappointing, normally unsuccessful. But, but look at what happened to Aleppo. That's the true nature of war. That doesn't change. How war is fought changes all the time with thinking uh, and technology. Uh, and military technology has already changed in ways that the West has been slow to, to recognize. Now, of course, I could talk about nuclear proliferation. That, that matters. But set that aside. We live once again uh, in the era of the missile. It is the precision conventional missile that dominates um, military conflict. You can see this beginning to, to play out, both in a defensive sense, and let, let's be clear, the US Navy will get no closer than 1,000 miles to the Chinese coast, and probably no closer than 300 miles uh, to, the, to the Russian coast, as we live in the era in which uh, anti-access aerial denial technology developed over the last 20 years is designed to keep us at range. And secondly, much as we might worry about building fifth and sixth generation manned aircraft for some mad reason um, in order to bomb our opponent, the fact is London is 90 minutes by cruise missile from Russia, and that cruise missile will shortly come at hypersonic speeds and be accompanied by its ballistic counterparts with a two-meter accuracy and a 400-kilogram payload. So how do you keep that out, and how do you do that? We live in the era where the Western investment in platform-centric capability, ships, aircraft, bases, headquarters above ground, all of that is now hostage to an era which will be dominated by the precision um, conventional missile. And, of course, the battle for space, uh, the cyber uh, uh, arena, and uh, the powerful, maybe pivotal arena of how you can touch the population of your opponent at an individual level through social media in a way that can be highly manipulative and effective. You bundle all that together, our armed forces and indeed our security architectures are rooted in a 20th century security paradigm which technology has already washed away. And there have been accompanying changes in, um, in method and Elizabeth very eloquently described some of the asymmetry that's playing out um, uh, in, uh, in the Gulf and, and elsewhere. But we need to recognize that two powerful things have happened just in the last 10 years. The first is the reinvention, if that was necessary, of proxy war, where the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps sets the pace. So war prosecuted in a way where not many uniforms involved, but it's still really powerful. Um, and, um, and, and the West um, has had a go, uh, failed absolutely in the, in the creation of proxies in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, but has recently learned to do a, a little better uh, in Syria. And then hybrid conflict, or gray space, or tolerance, or whatever you want to call it, that this fusion of all the levers of a nation's power set aside their military capability to disable, disrupt, discombobulate your, your, your opponent. And we see that's what Russia has done to the US and to the UK and others. 
None of it yet strategically successful, but it is now a feature of, uh, of the everyday uh, landscape. And if you combine those two things, the, miss the missile age and uh, the, the, the power of all other levers of power to shape uh, and influence your opponent, People like me will construct a, a 21st century military strategy, so I'm going to call to you decisive influence from range. So if I want to break France, and it's a, an abiding thought uh, as, a, as an Englishman, uh, then I, I believe I can do that without any form of 20th century physical intervention. I will break a country like France through the application of uh, precision missiles, against critical national infrastructure, I will bring their daily life to a halt. I will magnify that by offensive cyber to the bits I can reach, and I know that's really, really difficult. I will employ proxies to sow discord and sabotage, and I will amplify all of that by the manipulation of social media so that every single French citizen thinks their life is about to go to hell in a handcart. And I know how to do that and I don't have to put a boot on the ground. Now, I'm not saying that's the only military strategy. I'm not a silver bullet uh, fanatic. I'm saying it's a credible 21st century approach. We do not know how to deal with people like me doing that. Other countries have thought it through um, more thoughtfully. So why European security? So what about Russia? Well, if, if you're uh, in NATO uh, and in the British military, Russia is a really big thing. For all the reasons I've described to you, we need to see Russia as just a little speed bump on the way to the problem of China. Russia is what it is. It is a declining, massive country riven by problems, um, massively over-talking its game, uh, and, and allowed to be successful because it's not encumbered by our laws and values. But it's not going to invade Europe. It may have localized territorial ambitions. But frankly, we need to ask, ask, begin to ask ourselves the much bigger question, which is, how is the US going to manage the dual challenge of Russia and China? And it accepts it can't do with both. And the answer to that question, the only answer to that question, is it will come to some form of accommodation with Russia uh, on the way to China. And we're probably all going to be in that space. And wouldn't that be more, um, uh, more sensible? And where is Europe in this? Well, as I've described, comfortably uh, gazing at our navels, in my case, obsessing over, uh, over, over Brexit, uh, worrying about our social models, fatigued by our discretionary interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan, and trying to persuade ourselves that all war is now discretionary and we can choose not to be touched by it if it, if it doesn't uh, bother us or it's very far away. Um, we want to be in, in a place where we... Um, we can worry about the effects of austerity, our social model, our relationships with our neighbors in a trading sense, and have no thought to our security. We are running on the comfort zone of the post-Cold War era, and we are utterly incapable of breaking out of that. No political dynamic, no civil society pressure, because nothing bad has happened yet. And everything I'm talking about would require societies and governments to take really quite difficult decisions about investment and capability, the reset of resilience, and the way we approach our security in this much more demanding world, at the expense of the things we're obsessing over now and want to spend our money on and believe in some entitled way, and we didn't all go to Eton, that um, that's how the world is always going to be. I don't think that holds water. So the way forward, well, what do we need to do? Well, the first thing is we have to reframe the strategic discussion, not about peace and war, but around a model of what I'm going to call the four C's. We compete with some, we cooperate with some countries, we compete with others, we confront and we occasionally conflict and we move along a dynamic spectrum. So the, the, the paradigm of peace and war, except in a legal sense, is I think um, uh, very unhelpful. In that, in that dialogue we must throw away our touchstones and our preferences from the post-Cold War era and think about the implications of this much more demanding world around the sorts of factors um, I, I've described. That discussion, frankly, is nowhere. The second thing we have to recognize is we will only secure ourselves through collective security. Uh, we, we have demobilized our major military alliances in the, in the, in the, in the case of um, NATO, and the EU, which has tremendous soft power uh, potential, uh, remains um, um, uh, stodgy, to, uh, to, to say the least. So how do you mobilize the potential power of Europe 
to protect its security and advance its interest in this much more difficult world. And the only way that's going to happen is by rethinking hard power. I'll come back to that. Gathering together public sector soft power, all the things a government does, and crucially, uniting it with private sector power. If you're in the UK and you want to make uh, an effect on the world, um, it's not what the military do. It's not even what the government does, some impact there. It's what the World Service does, or the Premier League does, or our entertainment does, or, or our tourism does. And we have to express ourselves in the world by this thoughtful union of hard power, public sector soft power, and private sector power if we are uh, to, uh, not to be done over. The next thing we, we uh, absolutely uh, need to do is to understand that in the way we think about conflict, we cover the whole game, and I've talked about it. So the asymmetry that Elizabeth Tribe is here to say, proxy war is here to say, the battle for space is here to stay, the battle for cyberspace is here to stay. And then we need to think about, uh, and I'll go into a bit more detail, the, 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 the reframing of, um, uh, of military power for the, for the digital um, uh, age. And that means we have to think about hybrid campaigning, not event, ma event management, in our relationship with Russia and China and Iran and indeed others in the future. And do that not as nations where we can picked off, but as a collective spirit. The discussion about how does Europe do hybrid campaigning is nowhere. There is no academic leadership of this, there's no political leadership of this, um, and states are still trying to raise their own game. The battle in Whitehall to organise for collective hybrid campaigning is stuck in a Whitehall preference for collegiate operations rather than um, a unity of purpose or even of, uh, uh, let alone of command. The next thing we must do is reframe national resilience. Elizabeth has described this. This is about the resilience of civil society, of the role of the citizen. It's not so much about the armed forces in the face of decisive influence from range if it comes to conflict, but definitely hybrid tweaking and um, the bad things that may come with a world that's um, running out of energy and water and all those, uh, those other things. And the final thing, and my core sport is, we need to transform our militaries for the digital age by the application of combinations of digital age technology, data, processing, connectivity, AI, robotics, uh, nanoscience, gene engineering, all of these things in, in combinations. The UK, the Chief of the Defence Staff last week, has for the first time set out uh, what this begins to look like, and it is the most profound change of military organisation, <coughs> method and process for more than 150 years. The reshaping of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, reconnaissance away from answering a question by writing an <coughs> essay to making your intelligence organisation operate like a newsroom. The reframing of command and control around AI and data. We, we are all capable of halving the number of military headquarters we currently have and halving the size of those that remain. And in there, there's a phenomenal saving and a major effectiveness boost. We will reframe combat power, combat support and combat service support power away from a combination of very expensive people in uniform and platforms which we can barely afford in small numbers, can't afford to replace, definitely can't afford to lose, to a thoughtful manned, unmanned and autonomous mix. We will break our people paradigm because we'll hire a few expensive people and we'll break our equipment paradigm because we won't need to buy Formula One cars in the shape of aircraft carriers <coughs> anymore. We'll do this in a much more thoughtful, uh, much more thoughtful with our allies, and we will underpin all of that with a digital backbone of cloud, AI, connectivity, and a single synthetic environment. The application of gaming technology to government and defence, uh, from uh, situation understanding, decision support, conduct operations, training, in a way that frankly will actually um, pay for itself. Uh, we need to do all of those things, I would argue, if we are to um, uh, make our way in this more challenging world. We are currently doing hardly any of those things, and so I think you, can, you, you could judge uh, European security right now as stuck in what I'll call strategic Nero syndrome, uh, and if we don't break out of it, uh, then we are going to feel in the coming decades like a snowflake uh, in, in a dust storm. Thank you very much.